Hi, this is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester and Director of the Arnott Teaching and Research Forest at Cornell University and with Cornell University Cooperative Extension. It's my pleasure today to offer an introduction to the identification and ecology of northeastern conifers. We'll be looking at 10 different conifers that are native and non-native, but that are common, relatively common, and in the case of the non-native species have naturalized and are commonly occurring on the landscape. I'd like to acknowledge resources that I've used to make this presentation possible. Uh, first, many of the pictures come from a, from a website known as forestryimages.org. This is a uh, an effort by a number of people to accumulate thousands of pictures and make those accessible to people like me who are giving presentations on topics like this. Uh, those have all been uh, appropriately noted and uh, I give my personal thanks for the efforts of those uh, photographers to share their work. There are a couple of publications that the U.S. Forest Service has put together that are important contributions to understanding the ecology and the life history of these species. It includes the Silvix Manual that you see listed. And the easiest thing to do is a Google search for Silvix Manual or the Woody Seed Manual. So between these two you can learn about what the reproductive characteristics are through the Woody Seed Manual and then the, the life history characteristics, uh, the living plant component through the Silvix Manual. There are uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of guides that you can use for tree identification, two that I think are particularly good for different reasons. Uh, one is the Know Your Trees publication. This was originally developed as a 4-H youth publication, but it includes basically the 50 common trees of New York. So if, if you're in New York, this is good, and it certainly has applications in other areas of the Northeast. Also uh, identified as New York but having very widespread um, appeal and a very high quality is a book called Trees of New York Native and Naturalized. This was uh, written by Dr. Donald Leopold, published through Syracuse University Press. Don Leopold is a dendrologist and forest ecologist who uh, is a professor at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. There are three things that I hope you're going to learn as a result of this presentation. Uh, one is I want you to be able to list um, tree identification learning skills. So there's a set of skills. Anytime we learn anything, there's a set of skills, um, kind of a roadmap for, for the most efficient way to learn that knowledge. So we'll be talking about that, and I, I hope that you're able to recognize that. And that's important because we're not going to teach, I'm not going to teach, and you're not going to learn everything there is to know about all of the conifers, even about the conifers that I cover. You won't remember everything. So you need to form a framework to learn um, to learn how to learn. Uh, specific, specific to the conifers are to be able to recognize those features of conifers that aid in identification. So what are the things when, you, when you're presented with a particular conifer that you should look at uh, to focus on so that you can learn uh, what that conifer species is. I want you to be able to understand differences among conifers for particular habitats and ecological features and uh, to be able to recognize two what are known as best recognizable features uh, for at least five of the ten conifers that we're going to cover today. So you have, you know what you need to know and we'll proceed from here. The first of these steps is to think about the components of learning and we'll look at four different aspects of this. And, and this is not specific to conifer tree identification, but more to tree identification. In general, I think of these as the components of learning. So what are the, what's the skill set that you need to, to master in order to be good at tree identification? And just so you know, tree identification, the formal study of tree identification would be called dendrology, the study of trees. One component of learning is to be able to match the descriptive characteristics of a plant or a tree with what you see as you hold that specimen. So you can pick up particularly a more technical sort of guide would provide certain descriptive phrases such as arcuate venation if we're thinking about foliage on some species like the dogwoods or buckthorn. 
or two ranked needles if we're looking at some of the conifers and and you can read those words but to be able to visualize what that means and to understand whether or not um, the specimen that you're holding the plant specimen that you're holding matches with that particular phrase so that's something that that you is is a very difficult uh, skill to acquire when you're first getting started with tree identification as you get more familiar with it or if you can work with somebody that's more familiar with tree identification you can start to know whether or not what you see is actually um, what's being described recognize that features some features will consistently vary more than other features uh, and that some features don't maybe don't vary at all uh, particularly with the hardwood species the deciduous species people like to use leaves because they're available but leaves are also the most variable part of of hardwoods uh, with with conifers there tends to be I think maybe less variation with the foliage um, and uh, you can you can you can use the features of foliage and bark and twigs and leaves to differing uh, abilities with conifers versus hardwoods and within conifers and, and um, among different species so you need to be attuned to the fact that just because a uh, descriptive book or a descriptive statement specifies some size or dimension or feature of a plant it isn't necessarily exactly like that the the process of tree identification necessarily uses terminology that we don't use in ordinary conversations so we almost never talk about use words like arcuate or venation or two ranked so as you're learning how to manage uh, terminology uh, you'll you'll be prioritizing how deeply you want to go into the glossary of words that are part of the of the tree identification process finally you're going to need to learn how to use dichotomous keys uh, we'll be looking at 10 different species that's a small subset of what you could be learning in the among the conifers of the Northeast and even that even if all we had were the 10 then at some point you're going to be you're going to be presented with a specimen and you're going to need to have a framework or a a path a flow chart if you will to uh, work through um, a series of questions that will lead you towards uh, identifying uh, putting a name on the specimen that you have so a dichotomous key provides you with a series of pairs or couplets of statements and you can make a decision whether it's one or the other and that eventually takes you to that final conclusion about what that species is <clears throat> continuing now with how we're going to learn trees there are a number of features of trees that are important for uh, for us to focus on when we're trying to learn them and they have varying um, utility to us as a field identification process for example flowers are the typically the definitive way that we go about identifying plants but with trees they're often inaccessible they're at the tops of the trees or they're otherwise not in a position where we can gain access to them fruit is uh, sometimes accessible uh, with conifers it tends to be fairly accessible and often um, apparent uh, and these fruit of course result from flowers so in that sense the fruit tends to be fairly uh, diagnostic for um, fairly diagnostic for our use and tree identification twigs are more useful in hardwoods than in conifers but still can have value in conifers uh, in foliage the conifers um, conifer foliage is useful uh, it tends to be less variable than hardwood foliage so we can rely on that and will rely on that more as we talk about conifer identification the bark varies for some species it's diagnostic for others it's not crown architecture with conifers is diagnostic for a few species but not for all habitat or the types of environments where these places are found is often uh, most useful when we're within a genus so when we're talking about pine trees 
or we're talking about spruce trees, there are some there are some habitat differences that will help us sort out a dry site species, for example, from a wet site species. And then finally, shade tolerance is useful if we're in the field and we're looking at seedlings and we're thinking about full sun versus full shade. Uh, whether or not a species is tolerant or intolerant of shade is meaningful and helpful. The, the study of taxonomy is the ability to put organisms into a particular um, group or arrangement or hierarchy. Uh, conifers and all plants have a hierarchical arrangement. Uh, I've given here an example of the hierarchical arrangement of one particular species, eastern white pine, which is called Pinus strobus. And so we have the genus is Pinus, and then the species is strobus. And you can see that you could work your way up through the hierarchy, through the pines, and then the order, and the class, and division. So all of the identification that we're doing today is within the division of conifers. And there are different classes. So we'll have the pine class, which includes the pine family. We'll be looking at, at other um, um, members of this division of conifers as well. But this is just to give you a sense that there is a very structured way to look at and think about the way um, conifers and all plants are organized. I think there's some value in, um, and you could ask the question, why are we going to identify conifers? If we look at the variety of ways that uh, we depend upon conifers, we can see that conifers are actually an, impor an important part of what we do, often individually or as a society. Uh, there's some, I think, interesting historic uh, uses for conifers. They were, the, if you remember back to your American history, this, there was the broad arrow policy where the, where the British um, royalty had their agents come over and mark uh, individual stems of white pine with a broad arrow indicating that that tree belonged to the crown. This was one of the, the uh, policies that helped set tension between the American colonists and the British government. More recently then, but still a long time ago, there was the use of hemlock bark for tanning. So hemlock trees were cut down, the bark was stripped from those trees, and tannic acids were extracted from that bark so that uh, hides could be tanned and made into leather. And then still currently we have the utilization of conifers for pulp and paper making along with hardwoods which are used in pulp and paper making. Uh, building materials, essentially all of the lumber, the dimension lumber that we see moving around and that's used in construction is made out of conifers, not all of it northeastern conifers, although the the barn that you see in the, in the picture is made of, of local uh, conifers. All of those building materials, pressure treated lumber, all of that comes from conifers, usually the Pacific Northwest or the South. There is a, a lot of opportunity for Northeastern building materials. Conifers are important because they provide very unique wildlife habitat. And then there's still the potential for production of things such as turpentines and other chemicals that can be made from conifers. We'll be breaking out four general features of conifers. These include foliage, fruit, bark, and growth form. So let's now jump into the first of these species and we'll, we'll break out the information in these four different categories. The first that we're going to look at is one of my favorite conifers. Well, it's hard to say. I shouldn't say favorite because I like all of them, but this is one that I think has a lot of appeal for a number of reasons. This is eastern white pine or Pinus strobus. And the first thing we'll look at here is the foliage and the, 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 the characteristic of the genus Pinus is that the needles are arranged in clusters and those clusters are called a fascicle. So here we're getting into some of that term, terminology, fascicle. The fascicles in pines have two, three, or five needles. All of the, the white pine group, and there's an 
all we have in the northeast is the eastern white pine. There are some white pines or soft pines as they're also called in the Pacific Northwest. They all have five needles. So if, if you're in the northeast in the and particularly if you're not in an urban area where you might have a planted ornamental, but if you're out in the woods and you see a five needle pine, you can with certainty say this is eastern white pine. That foliage, when you look at it, has a whitish cast, if you see in the lower left-hand picture, a whitish cast that's associated with one side of the needle, has a row of specialized cells that allow for gas exchange. So it allows for the uptake of CO2 and the release of oxygen, and because conifers uh, have their needles year-round, they often have uh, specialized structures around those cells. Those cells are called stomata or stomatal cells and uh, their structures usually a waxy kind of coating that limits the amount of moisture that's lost. So that's what gives the whitish hue to the white pine is the uh, the waxy coating associated with those stomata. White pine has, and this for me is is the aesthetic appeal is that it has a very soft look to the foliage. And in fact, when you touch the foliage, it has a soft feel to the foliage. White pine and many of the pines have a growth form where they produce a whorl of branches. And so you can see the whorl of branches, uh, which is just a collection of branches that all happen at the same point on the stem, and then there's a section of stem that is free of branches in the other whorl. So each year that tree will produce a whorl of branches, so by looking at that at that series of whorls or, or uh, nodes and internodes, you're able to do two things. You can age a tree by counting the number of whorls, and you can also evaluate the relative growth rate of one year compared to the next. So on the right hand side you can see that there was fairly consistent growth in the two years that we can see, although the upper year maybe is a little bit longer uh, than the lower here. So the upper section is a little bit longer than the lower section. Uh, you can also see the picture on the left has that same pattern of world arrangements, and you can see with a cluster of trees how you can uh, potentially age those trees. White pine has a uh, uh, I think would be described as a dark blocky bark. Uh, you can see it here. It's kind of a grayish black color and it's quite blocky. Uh, on the side of this of the larger picture, on the left hand side you'll see a, a portion of a stem of red pine so you can get a little bit of difference in the color. We're going to talk about red pine in a minute but this provides a little bit of a comparison. The insert picture on the right shows a pocket knife next to the cone. The cone of white pine is the largest of all of the northeastern cones, and they'll range from oh, three or four up to maybe six inches in length. Uh, notice in a relative sense that there are um, a f relatively few scales, or the flat, um, circular looking uh, structures that are attached to the cone. Those scales are what protect the seeds. There's going to be a pair of seeds that are located on the interior of that scale. That's relevant because we're going to look at Norway spruce in just a minute and you'll see that for the same size cone it has maybe double the number of scales. Here's another look at white pine. You can see it as part of a landscape planting. Uh, has a very aesthetic, uh, soft but stately look to it. And you can also see the bark again is dark and blocky. So just so you know, dark and blocky is as a description for a bark isn't very unique. There's a lot of trees that would get the dark and blocky kind of description. So in a in a I don't know what kind of way, an interesting aspect of white pine, maybe not in a good way, but it's, if you think about this in, its, in, in an ecological sense, a forest health sense, it's quite interesting, is the role of the white pine weevil. The white pine weevil is an insect that will lay its eggs um, into the uppermost stem of the tree, that central leader, and then the larvae will um, 
will will um, chew around inside that stem. They'll hollow it out, and it will uh, kill that central leader. When it kills that central leader, the other the the lateral branches that were part of that whorl will bend upwards when the when this when the apical dominance is lost from that central leader the lateral branches will assume that they are supposed to play a role in apical dominance so you'll have multiple stems then trying to form the main stem you see that in the center picture uh, where you have multiple stems and then on the picture on the far right you see a tree that had uh, you can see a couple of things from that you can see in, in the case of the weevil you can see where the top was knocked out when that tree was maybe maybe 12 or 15 feet tall you can also see that the whorls of branches that lead up to that and they're large uh, large diameter branches so this was a tree that was probably growing in a fairly open condition because of the size of those branch stubs and then when it was 12 to 15 years 12 to 15 feet tall uh, the, the weevil got a hold of it and now there are three main stems so it's still growing the same amount of wood but the quality of that tree the, the products that you could extract from that are, are not as great so now let's look at these best recognizable features uh, it's a five needle tree and those needles as a characteristic for all of the pines occur in a fascicle what I forgot to mention was at the base of that fascicle there is a sheath that's a very thin almost an onion skin thick sheath that might be a few millimeters long with white pine it's deciduous so you'll see it early in the spring uh, as the as the needles are emerging but you will not see it later in the year or on older needles that fascicle sheath has fallen away the other pines have a persistent fascicle sheath this is the uh, longest cone of all of the eastern pines and has soft textured branches it's a very common species that occurs throughout the Appalachians from the southern Appalachians up through and into the maritime provinces uh, it's often found on well to excessively well drained soils on sandy soils but I've also seen it growing in swampy conditions where it can perch on hummocks um, or on moister soils where for whatever reason it's it's able to get away from hardwood competition because the seeds are wind dispersed like many of the pines and it's and it's able to establish on a variety of soils it's a common species that will colonize agricultural fields when they've been abandoned it's listed as being intermediate in shade tolerance its best performance is in full sun but when you have it in full sun that's where it's also most susceptible to the white pine weevil there's a fungus that we didn't talk about that but that is um, maybe not common but uh, but relevant and that is white pine weevil let's look now at our second pine uh, this is red pine or pinus resinosa and you can see in the left hand picture where I'm offering a comparison of red pine which is a two needle hard pine to white pine which is one of the soft pines and has five needles so two is red five is white and in the northeast um, other than other than white pine most uh, most commonly our pines are going to be two needled so knowing two needle doesn't tell you anything other than it's not a white pine in the in the picture on the right the close-up of that bud and then of the fascicles of needles you'll see a, a good illustration of what I mean as a fascicle sheath so it's kind of a a papery a very thin papery wrapping around the base of those of that fascicle in the case of red pine that that wrapping persists for the life of the needles in the case of white pine and what you see in the in the cluster of needles on the picture on the left that fascicle sheath has is deciduous and has already dropped away red pine is a more bristly looking and feeling has a coarser texture to the silhouette of the crown than does uh, e than does eastern white pine you see that illustrated here um, I think of a, of a bottle brush so a brush that you might use to clean bottles um, when I think about what 
I'm seeing uh, when I when I see a silhouette of eastern white pine. Or I'm sorry, of red pine. Red pine has an egg-shaped and I guess it's the size of a small egg cone. You'll notice this looks very different than the than the eastern white pine cone. Uh, characteristic of these um, hard pines, you'll see on the face of the scale a, um, a, a, a small structure in the center of the scale that in some species, particularly when you get into southern species, is armed. Uh, so that has, and there's a whole set of terminology that we're not going to get into, but this has, this has a, um, a projection that is not armed, uh, but that in some of the southern pine species would be armed. Here's the bark on red pine. It's called red pine, another common name for red pine. It's also known as Norway pine. And this has a reddish or a cinnamon colored bark. Uh, this would be less blocky and more um, elongated, flattened ridges. Um, and it tends to be fairly flaky so that if you were standing actually next to this tree and you were looking at the bark, you could see thin layers. Um, that are part of the bark structure. Red pine, like white pine, is a beautiful and stately tree. A picture of a of a plantation on the left where the trees are planted, of course, and then a picture of a tree on the right where you can see kind of the oval shape to the crown. So the, the crown architecture from a distance is fairly typical and consistent when the tree is growing in the open. Or when the tree is in the tree is intolerant of shade, it, it's a it's a lake state tree, so it's quite common as you go into Minnesota and Wisconsin. It occurs in New York, uh, in some areas of the Adirondacks. It's it's naturally occurring in other parts of the state. It was widely planted in reforestation efforts, uh, where the soils are deep and well drained. It tends to perform well where there's a hard pan and the roots bottom out, uh, if you will, fairly shallowly, the trees will grow for a while, but then they tend to develop some health problems. Here's a picture that shows the bark of two uh, probably 40-year-old trees. You see red pine on the left and eastern white pine on the right. You can see the differences in the bark, so you can see uh, the reddish kind of elongated strips of bark on red pine compared to the what looks like it's going to become blocky bark and darkish on the white pine. You can also see the whorls of branches. Uh, you can see that the that there was there are growth nodes uh, each of those uh, each interval of of the whorl of branches represents one year worth of growth. So to summarize, with red pine, it's a two-needle pine. Um, it has brittle needles. Uh, if you have, if you take the needles and you hold them in your fingers, uh, pinch them between your fingers, and you push your fingers together, the needles will will arc and will break cleanly. So those that's a, a characteristic that the other two-needle pines that we're going to talk about don't have. It has a cinnamon red bark. Uh, bristle brush looking branches and then a symmetrical oval crown. It's common throughout um, particularly the lake states and occurs in the maritime provinces and into New England. The natural stands and its best growth and development is on sandy soil. Uh, it's a, it's it with white pine tends to be an early successional species. It seeds well onto mineral soil following fire or following the abandonment of agriculture. Uh, if you um, if you're going to plant it, you need to be able to control the brush um, and and make sure that it has an, an open canopy because of the need for full sunlight. It is intolerant of shade. There are relatively few insects and pests that will do it serious damage. Uh, where it's grown in um, in a plantation setting, and particularly when it gets off site, uh, you may have some some fungal problems with scleroderis and then there's some recent investigations recognizing that an, an introduced wood wasp known as the Cyrex wood wasp uh, 
will cause mortality in these trees, that mortality is usually restrict, restricted to areas where it's growing in very dense stands, so uh, several thousand stems per acre, and uh, the wasp tends to favor the lower crown class and the weaker of those stems. We'll look now at our third pine. This you'll see again is a two-needled pine. This is also a native pine, so white pine and red pine and jack pine, also called gray pine, are all native. This has a much shorter needle than any of the pines we've seen so far. The white pine and the red pine tend to have two and a half to four inch long needles. Uh, the jack pine tends to have needles that are less than an inch. Uh, the other interesting feature beyond well so recognize it's a two needle pine you can see the fascicle and, and see that that fascicle sheath is persistent but the real uh, diagnostic feature is aside from the shortness of the needles is the fact that the needles diverge and when we look at the next species it's relevant to note here that those needles are relatively flat and straight the next species we'll look at those needles will twist so oftentimes, just as an aside, when we're learning to identify trees, we talk about the feature of a tree relative to other trees, and oftentimes we haven't learned that other species yet. So just kind of um, keep this image in your mind where you have these straight, divergent needles. Here are some pictures of cones at various stages of development. The upper right-hand picture shows a relatively juvenile cone. You see a picture in the center and the bottom that's a more mature cone. And then finally, what's characteristic of this pine and uncharacteristic of other pines is that the cones are both persistent and serotonous. So persistent means that they persist through time. They stay attached to the tree. The other pines that we're going to be talking about don't do this. None of the other common pines of the Northeast do this. There's a pine, and I haven't seen it in quite some time, pitch pine that may have some level of persistence. Um, but you can see so you can find multiple years of cones um, attached to the jack pine. That's the persistent, the serotonous nature is that it requires a fairly high temperature in order for those cones, for the scales on that cone to open up. One of the historic ways that this would happen with jack pine is the jack pine is known as a fire adapted species. If there was a ground fire, the fire would burn through and the heat would open up those cones and the seeds would be dispersed. Now the advantage for the species is that you with the fire you have a preparation of the ground in a way that is conducive to the germination of seeds. So if you keep your seeds essentially stockpiled in persistent cones uh, you then wait for so to speak if trees were thinking organisms that could uh, anticipate the need to wait um, they would wait for the fire to pass through. The heat of the fire would open up those cones, uh, the, and the seeds would be dispersed onto a mineral soil seedbed, which is what's needed for that species to, <coughs> to germinate. Uh, I have heard uh, in situations following, for example, aggressive cutting, where you have a high level of reflection of light and temperature that with that aggressive cutting there is there can be enough heat to open up some of those jack pine cones. Uh, this was a species that I learned about or when I learned about this in forestry school uh, there is discussion of the uh, attempting to use fire as a management tool to create early successional young habitats of jack pine which were necessary for a bird the Kirkland warbler and there were some at that point, there were some um, um, problems where which had developed when a fire got out of hand, and there was a prescribed burn. The prescribed burn, the fire got out of hand. There was uh, some negative interaction with um, a local human community, and the the challenge was the, that the that forestry practices um, were being used in a way to favor. A wildlife species but at the expense of humans. So there's some conflict there um, in, in how this species was managed. Uh, 
here's a look at the bark. Um, in my mind, not a very attractive looking bark. Uh, I'm not even sure how I would describe it other than maybe dark and blocky. Noting that there are, um, it tends to be, it can be limmy when it's growing in these early successional open habitats. It retains those lower branches. Um, it's not usually thought of as a timber species that might be used for pulpwood. It does have the ability to grow on very poor soils, uh, so it's an it's an it serves in an ecological niche where you have um, um, harsh environmental conditions, low fertility. Uh, this is a species that can survive there. So even um, you know it's it's an important species in that regard because it's it's able to occupy a site, stabilize the soil, provide shade. Um, and provide some other characteristics, habitat features that some of these other species, white pine and red pine that we've talked about, would not be able to satisfy. Okay, to summarize jack pine, we see its best recognizable features are that it's a two-needle divergent straight needles. It grows on dry soils and it has persistent sessile and serotonous cones. So I say variably serotonous. Um, I guess there are some um, varieties or genotypes of jack pine that have a variable serotony. It's uh, spotty in New England. It's more common in the lake states and central Canadian provinces. There are some places in northeastern New York where it does occur naturally. I mentioned it's it's able to survive in harsh conditions, these infertile sandy soils and rocky outcrops. It's a shade intolerant species, so it's it's a early successional and often will uh, be able to reseed where it occurs naturally. It's able to reseed following fire that removes the litter and opens those serotony, serotonous cones. There are um, a variety of potential insects and fungi. We don't usually hear about them here mostly because it's a relatively infrequent species. The next species of pine is Scotch pine, Pinus sylvestris, and this is, a, is the first of the introduced species, so this is not native to the United States, it's native to Europe, and it forms, just kind of to put this in a context, it forms a an ecological parallel, if you will, to jack pine. And we'll see that it's it's intolerant of shade, it grows, it's able to survive and grow fairly well on quite poor soils, it has variable growth forms, but it tends not to be recognized as a particularly good uh, timber species. Uh, one of the important recognizable features is the, uh, are, are that the needles are uh, two per fascicle, you can see that. You see the persistent fascicle sheath, uh, but what you also, I want you to recognize, and if you remember back to jack pine, here the needles are twisted or spiraled, so it looks like somebody took a hold of, of each end of the needle and rotated their hands in different directions and it put a twist onto that needle, or you might think of a drill bit, for example. Scotch pine has, uh, like red pine, has kind of a bristly look to it. The needles are, are maybe two-thirds the length of the needle of red pine, so it's a much shorter uh, needle length than red pine, but it has that same look to the plant when you're looking at it in silhouette. It's not... Um, most people would, would probably encounter this, either seen it as a plantation when you're driving around, and I'll, you've, you've probably already seen it, and you may not know it, I'll show you what to look for, or it's also a relatively common, at least when you get into the Midwest, a relatively common Christmas tree. Here is the cone. The cone is a little bit like um, red pine, but it tends to be a squatter, squattier, if that's a word, um, a stubbier looking cone. You can see the picture on the left, like the other hard pines, that there's that protrusion from the center of the scale. The bark on Scotch pine is quite interesting. 
the mature bark is here we go again dark and blocky so we're not really gaining much ground with that but what's what's diagnostic is the upper crown the younger bark of the tree is a rusty red or an orangish red and it's papery so it looks like something had climbed up that tree um, had peeled away the mature bark and left behind a kind of a graded look to that grated so g-r-a-t-e-d like you know something that had been you know abrading the surface of that stem that's not the case at all it's just the way the tree looks so when you're driving around and you see these uh, plantations where you have all the same species and you have that rusty orange look to the upper stem that's a scotch pine here are the best recognizable features paired needles they're twisted the orange flaky bark in the upper stem variable stem quality uh, many of the early plantations in new york were derived from seed and seedling from as i recall southern europe and those performed very poorly in new york particularly in northern new york and those those uh, plantations of scotch pine had a, a very tattered look and the stems were unimpressive either in their size or in their straightness. I'm, I have heard that the northern genotypes, so the species or specimens of this species that came from northern Europe, performed um, uh, more favorably in our climate. So it's widely planted currently for Christmas trees, for windbreaks. Um, it grows reasonably well. Um, it was initially thought that it might be a potential timber species. That has not played out. Um, so it's currently best use is, would be for wildlife and Christmas trees and windbreaks. Uh, there is some evidence that in some circumstances, but not all, it may naturalize near plantations, so you'll see it popping up here and there, but it's, it has not developed the invasive qualities of uh, being an, an aggressive colonizer. And as I mentioned, it's intolerant of shade. That concludes the coverage of pine. Uh, we, we've covered the common pines, the, the native pines. I think we've got all the, the, particularly the common native pines. The other two native pines you might see in some circumstances would be pitch pine and Virginia pine. Uh, pitch pine is a three-needle pine. Uh, Virginia pine is a two-needle pine. I've seen those growing in coastal rocky outcroppings in Maine. Uh, I've never seen those growing in the interior. Another non-native species of pine that you might find, so the genus Pinus, is um, black pine or Austrian pine, Pinus nigra, and uh, you might see that occasionally growing in, in ornamental settings. I don't, it's not common as a plantation species, so it's not one that you would likely see. Moving to a new genus, we'll cover first um, eastern hemlock, Suga canadensis. And there are two species of hemlock that we have in the eastern U.S. We have um, eastern hemlock or Canada hemlock, and then we have a Carolina hemlock, and that's, I believe, uh, Suga caroliniana. So one of the first things we'll see here is that the needles are arranged not in a cluster, but rather are borne singularly on the stem. So we have individual single needles, and this is characteristic it's not characteristic, it's other than the pine, that's the way the others are done. So the hemlock look like this, the fir look like this, and the spruce look like this, the arrangement of the needles. This is a, where you can, a good example, we talked about two ranked foliage. So you can see the foliage is pretty much attached and oriented in a way so that you have, um, uh, the, the, the foliage has uh, two dimensions, or it's a well, it's, it's projected in, in uh, two orientations, uh, to the left side and the right side. Another interesting characteristic, and if you look closely at the picture on the left, you'll see uh, the two-ranked foliage is quite large, and then about every fourth needle, you will see a smaller needle that's maybe a third the size of the primary needles, that needle is attached to the top of the twig and it is inverted. So that's characteristic of this particular species, eastern hemlock. Uh, 
Uh, if you looked at, if you were to look at the lower side of the needles, you'll see two white bands. Those white bands are the waxy coatings of the stomata, and uh, the white bands themselves are not diagnostic because you will find those also in fur. Here we look again. This is a close-up of uh, eastern hemlock, and it better illustrates the small inverted needles. And you can see those small inverted needles along that upper stem. I said that was characteristic to the species. I'd need to check and see. I don't know if if it is characteristic to Suga canadensis or if Carolina hemlock has that or not. When we look at the fruit and the bark, the fruit is uh, it's, if you can use the word cute, um, they're cute little cones. They're about the size of a small marble, and it looks just like a, like a full-size cone, but it's much smaller. So it's a, it's an attractive little, from an ornamental perspective, it's or a decorative perspective, it's a, it's an attractive little cone. Diagnostic is the bark, and if you cut away the bark, as you can see, kind of in a in a side cutting fashion you will see that the bark is made up of layers and the between each of those layers there is a purplish um, film or membrane I don't know exactly what it is that causes that but when you cut it at the appropriate angle it it it, it, um, it displays that purplish um, structure as a striation so it looks like there's purple striations in the bark when you cut it in the northeast at least the only tree that does that is um, eastern hemlock this is a look at the bark a younger bark on the left a more mature bark on the right again we're back to this dark blocky bark so not a lot to help us there eastern hemlock tends to grow in um, uh, fairly unique settings it grows it's common on the slopes of ravines it's common. Um, it's very tolerant of shade, and it's and it's not browsed as heavily as some species under normal deer conditions. If we can think about whatever normal deer conditions are, so it can form. And because it's tolerant of shade, you can have multiple layers of hemlock or hemlock. Um, trees occurring that are multiple heights and by having that multiple height and that dense intertwining of branches you can create a very dark interior look to your woods. So here's here's a mixture of um, eastern hemlock and it's and it's creating this very dark shaded understory. Hemlock will occur in um, uh, it, it can occur on fairly dry sites, and it can occur on moist sites. Uh, everywhere in between, it can be on slopes, it can be on flats, so it, it'll occupy a wide variety of environmental conditions. Uh, because it's tolerant of shade, in fact, it's the most tolerant of our eastern conifers, you can find it growing uh, where other species might not grow in the dense understory. I don't have any slides of it. There is an insect pest that is that is increasingly common and it's spreading we think in New York and that's the hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid has been devastating to hemlock in the southern part of the range down in the central Appalachians and southern Appalachians. Uh, it's done a fair amount of damage as it's coming up the east coast and this insect is spreading and occurs in areas of the Catskills and in spotty areas of the Finger Lakes. So learn about um, learn about these this pest if if it's something that um, that you think might be in your area so eastern hemlock has uh, best recognizable features that include two ranked singular foliage with inverted upper twigs on the needles purple bark striations and persistent branches it's common in a broad uh, geographic uh, context from New England and the Lake State south along the Appalachians into northern Georgia. It's not particularly sensitive to soils, but those typically are found are moist or and with good drainage. Uh, it's common in riparian zones and ravines, but also occurs on moist flats. It's a common um, associate with the northern hardwoods mixture, 
uh, sugar maple, beech, and birch, yellow birch, and you might have beech, birch, maple, hemlock as well. So hemlock, northern hardwoods. You will find it um, being able to establish in heavy cuts and clear cuts. I've seen it growing and 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 uh, seeding in and becoming established. But more typically, you would try to regenerate this using a partial cutting method with soil disturbance or surface layer disturbance. Um, and we did talk a little bit about hemlock woolly adelgid. The next species is another um, shade tolerant species. This is red spruce or Picea rubens. Picea rubens looks a lot like um, in many respects looks a lot like Norway spruce and we'll talk about Norway spruce in just a minute. One of the characteristics of spruce, well it has singular foliage. Um, two of the characteristics that separate spruce, so the genus Picea, from other genera are that the needles are square in cross section. So when you take a needle and you're holding it between your thumb and first finger and you try to roll the needle, um, you will feel definite edges and sides as you're trying to roll that needle. You can roll it, the hemlock needles won't roll, the fir needles won't roll, uh, spruce will roll and they're four-sided. So that's characteristic of the genus. Another characteristic of the genus that's illustrated in the picture on the right is the presence of a structure on the twig that's called the sterigmata. Um, for some reason I've always really liked that word. It's, it's a great word if you're uh, really bored at a party or if you're conversing with somebody and you want to change the subject just talk about sterigmata and uh, and see where that conversation goes. But the sterigmata is the structure that's used to support the needle. Uh, once the needle falls out the structure remains and it looks like um, little bumps along the twig. So you can, somebody could give you a um, a dead twig from a spruce and you would be able to say with certainty this is a spruce tree. This is a look of the cone and of the foliage, a close-up. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful lustrous brown cone typically. The foliage is a dark green, um, very vigorous and healthy looking foliage. This is, I've already said the white pine was one of my favorites, well red spruce is also one of my favorites. Uh, just the aesthetic of the tree is not a very attractive tree. Red spruce is relatively tolerant of shade. Um, it's not as tolerant as hemlock is, uh, but hemlock and spruce will co-occur and it's possible to manage them in a way so that you can retain both species um, occupying the site. Red spruce is, is important uh, because it creates an important habitat characteristic. It's also important because it has a, a very good wood quality and so uh, if you have access to, to red spruce, the lumber of red spruce has has better construction and engineering specifications than white pine or hemlock do. Um, just an interesting note, spruce was, as I recall, spruce was the species that's used to make fine violins. So the, the sounding boards within violins is often spruce, the the quality of the sound that comes from those from those spruce structures are important to making high quality violins. Red spruce will also grow in fairly harsh environments. You can find it, this is a, a mountain desert island on the coast of Maine uh, and red spruce will, will occur on these rocky outcrops where there's very little soil will often co-occur with black spruce um, and I'm, I'm as I understand it, uh, red spruce and black spruce will hybridize, so you can find hybridization of those species. One of the things, and I don't have a picture of it, one of the things if you were to take a hand lens or a micro, uh, microscope and look at the twig, you will see little hairs um, that are occurring on the stem of both red spruce and we'll see in a minute black spruce. On red spruce it's just a simple hair, there's no other features about it. On black spruce there's it's more like a lollipop in miniature so it's called a capitate hair um, and you need, you need it, you can't see this with the naked eye, you need a hand lens to see this. Here's a look of 
of just kind of a forest that might be growing um, red spruce. Okay, now the characteristics that are best recognizable, it's the second smallest of the spruce cones, black spruce being the smallest. Um, those cones are deciduous during the first year. Remember that species such as jack pine have persistent cones. Uh, uh, black spruce also has persistent cones. The margin of the cone or the edge of that cone scale is entire, which means that it's not broken up or chipped away. We'll see with black spruce that that margin is called eroded. And it's the most common spruce that we find within the range of spruce. It has fine hairs on the twigs, as I mentioned, but those hairs do not have a head. They're not capitate. This is common in the Maritime Provinces, uh, throughout New England and the Adirondacks and in the Appalachian Mountains down to the Carolinas. It tends to grow on acid soils, uh, where there's a well-developed humus layer. Um, the soils tend to be relatively moist and typically well-drained. It does have the potential to be wind-thrown because it is shallow-rooted. Uh, it's also quite long-lived, up to 400 years, and the seeds uh, do best germinating on to mineral soils. It's very tolerant of shade, but not as tolerant as uh, eastern hemlock. I've wondered if this might be uh, to the extent that we might want to find an alternative to hemlock, where we're losing hemlock to the to the hemlock woolly adelgid uh, under planting with red spruce into those areas would help maintain a conifer component. And there, because of the ability of these species to co-occur, that would be a a potential alternative. I don't know what the ecological trade-offs are if we shifted from uh, hemlock to spruce. Similar in many respects to red spruce is black spruce, Picea mariana. Uh, just at a quick glance you can see that there's much similarity in the foliage and in the cones. The foliage is um, the second year foliage tends to be this, the, this, the twigs that have foliage that's two years old. That foliage tends to be similar kind of in color and texture, maybe a little smaller, shorter than red spruce, but it's the new growth has a has a lighter color look, almost a bluish cast. I think that we're going to see in just a minute a close up of the cone. Um, but the cone on black spruce, if you could look at the margin of the cone, it would be eroded. So it would be like somebody had gone in and chipped away, I mean, little chipping marks along the edge of that particular cone. Black spruce grows often most commonly, well, the only place I've seen it has been in harsh environments. So it grows on mountaintops and in swamps and bogs. So uh, this is a species that uh, does well there. It's uh, it's not a species that you're going to commonly find just growing in the woods. So if you found a spruce, a native spruce growing in the woods, chances are it would be either white spruce or more likely red spruce in New York. Um, you can, uh, interestingly, where it's growing in wet areas, the lower branches can contact the surface, the wet surface. It'll be often in a sphagnum peat moss, and those branches that come down and come in contact with that wet moss can develop roots, and the tree can reproduce by a process known as layering. So to summarize black spruce, it has the smallest of the cones. It's the common spruce of bogs and on organic soils. The cones are persistent for two to three years. The cone margins are eroded and it has capitate hairs on the twigs. Similar range, um, but not quite as far south as red spruce. Uh, tends to be relatively tolerant of shade. Uh, and is also um, susceptible to the eastern dwarf mistletoe. Uh, there are a few insects, but not many, that cause problems. The last of our spruce is the non-native spruce. This is Norway spruce, or Picea abies. If you look in the lower left-hand picture, you see the dark green lustrous foliage. It'll remind you a little bit of the red spruce look. The color of the twig is similar. 
Um, what's dissimilar are the size of the cone. In the upper right hand corner you see the Norway spruce cones are large. They're about the size of a white pine cone, but these Norway spruce cones have many, many more scales. Remember the number of scales on the white pine cone. Uh, and this is this is useful because squirrels, to know this, squirrels will even chew off these cones, but you can still see the density of the of the uh, structures that supported those cones is much greater on Norway spruce than on white pine. Another feature that differentiates Norway spruce from red spruce is the architecture of the crown. In the lower right hand corner you can see a silhouette of Norway spruce and you see that you have the main stem which is vertical, you have the secondary stems or the primary branches, rather the primary branches that are attached to the main stem and then secondary branches that are attached to the primary branches, all of those secondary branches droop. So, um, so you have vertical main stem, horizontal primary branches, and then drooping uh, pendant secondary branches. So this is, this is a characteristic of the species, something you can identify from a distance. The final feature is associated with the terminal bud or the bud that occurs on the end of the twig and the spruce buds we don't usually use buds with conifers although you, in some cases you can the the bud scales are just like you have the scales on the cone but they're much finer those bud scales wrap around the cone they're imbricate which means they overlap so the shingles on your roof are imbricate so it has imbricate bud scales. With Norway spruce, unlike red spruce, those bud scales are reflexed. So the outer edge of that scale is rolled backwards. It's curled backwards away from, um, from the, the central part of that bud. On the red spruce, those bud scales are um, affixed to the bud. So the best recognizable features are the reflect, excuse me, reflexed terminal bud scales, the size of the cone, and then also the reddish twig. We've talked about this. It is planted often in plantations. It has very good growth in some circumstances. It's, this, it's the conifer species that's a good choice to plant if you have wet soils and you're trying to reforest it. In some circumstances it will naturalize near plantations, but more often than not it's rare that you find this to be, uh, to be spreading aggressively. Okay, a couple more species to hit on here. Balsam fir, Abies balsamia. This is another species that has two ranked foliage like eastern hemlock. Uh, one of the differences with eastern hemlock and balsam fir is the bark. You remember the bark on hemlock as it got bigger was described as blocky. On balsam fir what you have develop are balsam blisters. So you can see some of those kind of blister-like structures that are occurring on the stem. In that center picture, those blisters are filled with a resin that's both very aromatic and also very sticky. The fruit on balsam fir is described as erect, so it stands upright. All the other cones that we've described so far are all pendant, so they're dangling on the stem. The other feature with this cone is that it's deciduous at uh, maturity. So there's a central axis that the scales are attached to. When the cone matures, the scales break away and leave behind that central axis. So you can find a branch and you'll find this peg-like projection that might be a couple, two or three inches long. And without knowing it, you, would, you wouldn't realize that this was part of the fruit structure. Balsam fir is tolerant of shade. Uh, but it also can aggressively uh, seed into an area following an opening. So there's a couple of pictures here. You see on the upper left uh, what was probably a, um, a spruce budworm killed uh, conifer stand has reseeded itself to balsam fir. On the lower right you see an area that was damaged by a windstorm. There was uh, balsam fir growing in the understory and it's responded and, and or it seeded in and it's responded very well to this disturbance. 
Balsam fir can be tolerant to the shade, so it can become established and stay uh, growing at a fairly small size and then take advantage of the openings. All right, to summarize balsam fir, two-ranked foliage, there's no sterigmata. It's very aromatic, the foliage, as well as those resin blisters. Uh, the, the fruit is an upright cone, and the stalk is persistent, so the scales are deciduous. It occurs um, in the maritime provinces throughout New England and New York, uh, into the lake states, as well as into some of the western, west-central Canadian provinces. Wide range of soils, but oftentimes moist organic soils, and it's quite a common co-associate co-associate with red spruce. So you talk about spruce fir forests. It may establish under heavy cover because it's um, tolerant of shade um, and it's also able to come in following canopy disturbances. Uh, it's one of its advantage over red spruce is that it can germinate better on leaf litter, intact leaf litter, than spruce can, but it tends to be shorter lived than red spruce. Uh, it is susceptible, curiously, it's more susceptible to the spruce budworm, as I understand, than is the, are the spruces. Eastern larch, or tamarack, or another common name is hackmatack, um, Larix laricina. This is uh, not one that you're going to see as commonly as some of the European and Japanese planted species, but we're going to talk about the native species, eastern larch. So this is a species where uh, if you were to look at the picture on the left, you would see each of those little stubs has a cluster of needles. And you might want to think that those are, that that's a fascicle that has 25 or 30 needles in it. It's not. What you're actually seeing is a branch that did not elongate, but rather just um, allowed the foliage to expand. So you can imagine a bud that enclosed that that is um, potentially uh, could develop into a stem, and that if it's that stem elongated for 12 or 16 or 18 inches and it had needles on it, uh, what that would look like if the stem itself did not elongate, but the needles still emerged. So you would have this cluster of needles that comes out. It almost looks like a, a firework display um, that's exploding out from that. It's called a spur shoot. So those spur shoots, and I don't know why, will remain as spur shoots uh, for multiple years. Uh, and then at some point, some of them will, something changes, and that short shoot then emerges into a long shoot. The buds, I'm sorry, the cones look similar in some respect to the cones of, of eastern hemlock. You can see them here. They tend to be erect and upright on the, on the twigs rather than the hemlock cones, which are pendant. Eastern larch can be um, Planted in plantations, one of the interesting things about larch is that it's a deciduous species. All of the larch are deciduous. Uh, and, and if you've read the book by Aldo Leopold, the Sand County Almanac, you'll know that Aldo, Aldo Leopold, who was in Wisconsin, referred to or would use uh, eastern larch as a, uh, as a calendar aid, if you will, and he would talk about the need to go grouse hunting when the larch had turned to their golden color. So it's kind of a poetic way to think about uh, the relationship that we have with trees and the way the trees help signal changes in the season. Here are some more pictures of hemlock, or I'm sorry, of, of uh, tamarack, eastern larch or tamarack. In the upper left-hand corner you see a native uh, stand of, hem of tamarack. Uh, this is a species that growing naturally will often occur in swampy areas, but can occur as a plantation uh, planted onto uplands. So the best recognizable features for larch include that it's a deciduous conifer. The other two deciduous conifers that I know of are the dawn redwood and bald cypress. Needles are clustered on shoots, but they're not clustered in fascicles. The fall color is a yellow gold.
It's tolerant of many soils. It's most common on moist organic soils, and where it naturally occurs, it might uh, commonly associate with black spruce. It's very intolerant of shade, uh, unlike some of these other um, conifers we've just been talking about. It tends to be rot resistant. It's been um, used in, together with its European and, and Japanese um, uh, similar species, the Japanese larch and the European larch. Rot resistant has been used as poles in the, in the expanding hop industry. Uh, I recall that the paper that was uh, produced from uh, eastern larch was was used to make the transparent um, windows that we have in some of the envelopes. I suspect that's not the case anymore, but that was originally one way that it was used. Okay, so our final species is northern white cedar. This is, again, one of my favorite conifers. You can I pretty much like them all. I like this one because the there's something about the foliage that makes this look very palatable. Now I can say I've never eaten uh, northern white cedar, um, but if I was going to eat any of the conifers, this is the one I would want to start with. There's just something about this tree that makes it look uh, looks like it would be tasty. Uh, the lower side of the foliage has a whitish cast to it. The upper side of the foliage has a dark green glossy appearance. The needles are not needles. Uh, in the sense that we think of spruce and hemlock and fir and pine, um, tamarack, but they're they're modified needle-like structures. They're in in diagnostic books and field guides. You will you might um, see them described as all-like um, modified leaf structures. The bark on northern white cedar is flaky, stringy, and elongated. It's actually fairly diagnostic when you see the bark. And you can see the fruit on the right is, uh, I th always think of it as looking like a wooden rose. So it's the wooden rose plant. Northern white cedar grows often in um, boggy areas. Uh, that's where I've most commonly seen it. And it grows uh, throughout the northeast and, and into the lake states. It will form um, nearly pure stands of northern white cedar, and these stands will be quite dense. Um, it'll it'll block a lot of the snow. Oftentimes, these cedar stands will, will serve as deer wintering yards for deer. The deer can get in there because of the heavy cover. Hemlock will do this as well. There's not as much snow that gets on the ground, so the deer uh, don't have to work so hard to move through the snow and they have a bit of a of an insulating layer because these conifer crowns will will um, catch the snow and create a blanket. The other feature that you can see in this picture is the shape of the crown. So the crown tends to be relatively narrow but elongated um, uh, and and has a, a characteristic form. So the foliage, these best recognizable features, these are flattened scale-like uh, foliage. It's quite aromatic. It's an attractive aroma. The cones look like wooden roses. Uh, commonly occurs on swampy soils, but can also occur on dry, high pH sites. Um, and so it covers a wide range of soils and tends to be less acidic, more neutral than some of these other conifers. Relatively few insect or disease press, but it is preferentially browsed by deer, so deer can have a very strong negative impact on this species. Uh, the species is important for use in rustic furniture. You'll see lawn furniture that's made out of, out of the intact stems, but also sawing it into boards, um, fence posts for that same reason, and then deer yards. So to close, uh, and I'm Sorry, I went over my hour uh, target time. Uh, in closing, tree identification is fun. I think that you know the more you do it, the more fun you're going to have, and it's a great way to to justify going out and spending time in the woods. Uh, 
There are a lot of field guides out there. I hope I've given you enough information that you can go to these field guides and say this is providing me the, the types of detail that I need for the types of features that are going to be important for identification. As you learn, I'd recommend that you make a collection of twigs and cones and whatever. You could put numbered labels on them so you can test yourself or just write the name of the actual plant. But when you have these features in front of you paired together, so when you have red spruce and black spruce cones together, or when you have larch and hemlock cones together, or when you have scot uh, scotch pine and jack pine foliage together, when you can make those side-by-side -side comparisons, you're going to really start to Im ingrain in your mind the differences. You can write up some of these best recognizable features on flashcards. And I've made some hints mostly to texture and smell, uh, but the visual, so we have sight, um, eyes, and olfactory senses, sound and taste don't really come into it. Uh, but you can use more than just your visual capacity to learn to identify these plants. Uh, Approach learning in a structured fashion. So don't just say, okay, there are 10 conifers or there's 72 conifers, and I'm going to memorize them all individually. What I tried to do by talking about the taxonomic hierarchy, and then when I presented this, I talked about here are all the pines, um, here are the spruce. I didn't start, I could have started with here are the wet site species and moved down through here are the dry site species. Uh, Break up your learning taxonomically so that you understand what are the characteristics of a given genus. So if it's pine, here are the genus characteristics. If it's spruce, here are the genus characteristics. And then within a genus, what are the species characteristics? So structure your learning rather than just trying to independently memorize each of the individual species. And then know that you're going to accumulate knowledge through time. So it can be, I remember it being very frustrating to learn tree identification. The more time you spend with it, the easier it becomes. Um, try not to let yourself get frustrated by the variation that naturally occurs with these trees because through time you'll you will learn what you need to focus on and what you don't need to focus on. So with that, thank you very much. I hope you have enjoyed this presentation.